Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Shrek Into the Com video, we're going to be discussing three pieces of news which are doing the rounds in the tech industry. The first of which is AMD being reported to be cutting prices for the Ryzen 7 range of CPUs rather significantly in some instances. Intel's i9, 7900X smashing some Cinebench records, and finally, Samsung developing a rather interesting technology for virtual reality, specifically a VR display with 3.5 times more pixels than either the Rift or the Vive. We're going to be starting things out with Ryzen because it's the quickest of the uh, news to go through, and it's a very simple piece of news. Currently, of course, uh, we're all waiting for the launch of Threadripper, which is going to be naturally on a new platform, X399, and is going to sport a myriad of different SKUs. If you want more information on that, you can go ahead and check out today's video or yesterday's video where we go into quite in-depth analysis. But that does leave a few interesting questions, the most pertinent of which is the pricing. It doesn't make sense for a huge disparity between the high-end uh CPUs on AM4, let's say the 1800X, and a 10-core CPU on the X399, also known as a Threadripper. Therefore, AMD have decided to probably jump ahead of this and started to cut prices. What type of cuts are we looking at? Well, it does depend, of course, on the retailer, but anywhere between 10 and 20-ish percent seems to be doing the sales banners across the internet. For example, on Amazon.com, you can pick up a Ryzen 7 1700 for $30 off, making it just $300. US The 1700X is actually a really nice uh, discount, $50 off, making it just $349.89 of all the prices. And finally, there's $455.81 US dollars being demanded for the 1800X, which is a saving of around $44 US dollars. Now, we were discussing earlier that there have been a series of leaks concerning the Threadripper SKU lineup. Obviously, we don't know if this is confirmed yet, but supposedly the 1955 is a 10-core 20-thread CPU, which has a turbo frequency of around 3.7 GHz and has a TDP of 125 watts. I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to be looking at the high 400 to maybe low 500 US dollar pricing for that, since obviously the clock speeds are slightly lower, um, especially in comparison to, let's say, the 1800X. It's possible also Threadripper will have a higher quality level of silicon. This is simply because of the sheer task of slapping so many CPUs together on the same die. Obviously, this is just speculation on my part, and quite honestly, until we get some average overclocks, and I don't necessarily mean uh, individuals who get sent review samples, engineering samples, and obviously then get to slap liquid nitrogen on them to see how far they clock, but rather the average user who possibly is going to have like an AIO or maybe high-end air setup or possibly a mid-range water loop. And then we can start seeing what these uh, processes can do at particular voltages. For example, are we going to see a lower average voltage for a specific overclock or possibly just higher overclocks in general? Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to wait. But it is a rather interesting piece of news, especially if you have been umming and on getting a Ryzen CPU. It's now very much in the realms of possibility for you to grab like a B350 motherboard, get like a 1700 processor, and away you go. The only slight issue I have with this is what is known as pricing proximity. We are now looking at substantially less difference between the 1600 uh, range, which of course is Ryzen 5, up to the Ryzen, 7, uh, Ryzen 7s. So for example, you can have like the Ryzen 5 1600 at around 220 US dollars, or the Ryzen 7 1700, which is around 220, sorry, 299 US dollars. So it's about $80 more for those additional cores, which to be honest, I guess, kind of makes sense given the rest of the CPUs in the Ryzen 5 lineup. So AMD do have a few issues with price proximity, quite simply, especially the Ryzen 5 series. There are so many CPUs very close to one another in pricing. It's kind of like, well, you don't have to spend that much more to get this many extra cores or this many extra clock, um, this many extra additional threads, actually, I guess is the more pertinent way of saying it. And of course, also the benefit of going with a higher end model. In most cases, you get a guaranteed higher clock speed. 
Okay, let's jump on to Intel, specifically the i9-7900X. This, of course, is based upon the Skylake X architecture, and Intel are referring to it as the i9. So, if one was to look at the stock clock, uh, yeah, stock clocks rather, it has a base clock of 3.3 GHz, this is a 7900X, just once again to clarify, whereas it can ramp up to 4.3 GHz with Turbo Boost 2, or 4.5 with Turbo Boost Max 3.0. As we've discussed in the case of, let's say, Turbo Max 3.0, it's only for a very limited number of threads in comparison to, like, the base clock, which, of course, is all of the different CPUs. But there's one good thing, very good thing, actually, about this particular series of CPUs. The X299 platform, from early reports, is going to be an absolute monster for overclocking, and there is an awful lot of tweaking available, including, believe it or not, a full ratio offset for the Advanced Vector Extension 512, also known as a VX512. This, of course, comes with the normal stuff for Intel, including uh, advanced memory controller, voltages, per clock uh, overclocking, per clock voltages, and so on, and so on, and so on. In other words, it's really cool stuff. So, what does that mean when it's put in the hands of someone who does overclocking fairly professionally? Well, monstrous performance, that's bloody what. An overclocker by the name of Elmer has managed to crank the CPU up to... 5,785 MHz in Citibench R11.5, whereas in R15 has managed to get 5,755. So in other words, a 30 MHz discrepancy. I'm going to make the assumption this is based upon stability. That's absolutely crazy. And the performance for these processors, well, rather these clock speeds, for Sydney Bench R15, 3,181 points, whereas on the other hand, for Sydney Bench R11.5, it's managed to achieve around 34.79. Now, the really nice thing about this is, obviously, this gives us an indication these processors do overclock fairly well, but, and it's a big but, it's the size of, I don't know, the Hollywood sign, this is done on liquid nitrogen. So this is not something, I'm pretty sure most of you are probably aware of this anyway, this is not something that you're going to be running 24-7 in your rig. It's obviously something that has been done for set records and for testing purposes and is certainly not akin to even a high-end water cooling setup. This is like multiple levels even above phase. Anyway, this is very impressive and was done on a motherboard by the name of an Asus Rampage 6 Apex X299 gaming motherboard. Bloody hell at these names, can I just make them a little bit shorter for the sake of, oh I don't know, speaking about them. And also a GeForce GTX 1080 tie and also G-Skill Trident Z a memory. Which of course, Trident, um, sorry, G-Skill and overclocking are pretty much synonymous with one another anyway. For those wondering, Ryzen has managed to achieve around the same clock speed, uh, with admittedly fewer cores. Um, earlier this year, we have seen around March-ish, if memory serves, I'll try to get a Google of it. I remember the 1800X hit around 5.7 to 5.8 on liquid nitrogen, and it also managed to shred and destroy various benchmarks. As a caveat to that, however, you are looking at silicon, which obviously had been available for longer, for A, and for B, you also had, well, fewer cores. So we're going to have to wait and see in the long game how Intel and AMD managed to kind of fight against one another. And let's be totally honest, Ryzen 7 is not as overclockable as the average Skylake CPU or what have you. So obviously, typically... Intel does have the clock speed advantage, which is definitely something of note. Also, and this is the final caveat, with Ryzen, I believe it was actually delidded, whereas on the other hand, with the Intel, from what I'm reading, it was not delidded. So that is also something to bear in mind. Finally, let's discuss virtual reality. Okay, so one of the issues with virtual reality is pretty simple. The more pixels you have, the more clear the image is, the more immersive it is. It's not just about number of pixels, of course. There are other questions you must start raising, such as latency and how can you reduce it. And, of course, the quality of the pixels, after all, if it looked like, oh, I don't know, wireframe models, or, oh, I don't know, let's say the virtual boy. It's not exactly a realistic depiction of VR. But still, the quest to 
cramming more pixels on a particularly sized display is definitely a noble goal for a lot of folks in the tech industry. Therefore, the fact that Samsung have managed to create a new VR display with a resolution of 2024 by 2200 is very impressive. It has a pixel density of 858 ppi or pixels per square inch. This is about 3.5 times that of either the Oculus Rift or Vive headsets managed to uh, plonk out. And this is on top of a 90 hertz refresh rate, which admittedly is not ideal for virtual reality. I would like to see over 100, 120, 144, or something like that. So it's not an ideal refresh rate, but it is still within the realms of acceptability for most folks. Obviously, some individuals may require higher for you know whatever reason for latency or perhaps a bit of dizziness. So it is still very impressive indeed. The only qualm I have with this is not really about the technology itself, it's more, you know, for the average user, and I say average user in a very loose term after all, virtual reality is not exactly widely adopted yet, and that is powering the damn thing. Obviously, while for a lot of games, an RX 480 slash 580 slash a GTX 1060 is technically enough to re uh, hit the minimum frame rates required and minimum level of performance required, Generally, if you're playing AAA games or, you know, very high-end games on virtual reality-based headsets, then you're going to want something more powerful. In the case of actually demanding over three times the level of performance, because obviously you're requiring three times the amount of pixels to be displayed, that means that obviously you're going to require an awful lot of GPU power to simply be able to pump out the frame rates. And make no mistake about it, 2024 by 2200 um, for just a single display is an awful lot of pixels. So there is that to take into account along with the high refresh rate. It's not like you can just get away with putting this out at like, oh, I don't know, 60 FPS or and possibly having it dip down to 40 at times. That's just not going to be acceptable. You really need to be hitting 60, uh, sorry, 90 FPS at all times or you're going to start getting a really unpleasant experience. Anyway, I think that's just about it for this particular video. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.